years of economic reforms, but is 1991 the benchmark? And does India always reform in a crisis? To the brink and back is Jairam Ramesh's book. He's been an insider as far as the reform process was concerned, has played uh, his own part in there. And it's indeed a pleasure to be talking to him as we celebrate those grand 25 years. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, your book does talk about economic reforms to the brink and back. Uh, my, my larger question to you is, and I think uh, you've been far more candid than some other people who've celebrated 25 years, is 1991 the benchmark of Indian economic reforms? No, no, undoubtedly. We had economic reforms in the 80s, but they were small incremental reforms. Mm -hmm. They were not systemic reforms. We had things like delicensing, broadbanding, a bit of you know uh, trade policy reforms here and there. But the paradigm shift that took place mm -hmm. Uh, on the fiscal side, uh, on the trade side, and on the industry side, the paradigm shift, a complete transformation mm -hmm. took place in 91. Remember what happened on the 24th of July 91 was the, the entire control system, uh, a bonfire was made That's right, uh, yes. of the control system. Right, right. Uh, the entire trade policy system, the anchors of the trade policy system mm -hmm. uh, were changed. And of course, on fiscal side, we were less successful. However, the broad direction that we must eliminate the revenue deficit and bring the fiscal deficit under control was first enumerated in 1991. So while it's true that 80s saw reforms, mm. but the 91 reforms was clearly a paradigm shift. At least we started speaking about fiscal deficit in common parlance, and I think that's a benchmark of a reform. But my larger question to you is, when you say to the brink and back, were we really at the brink in 1991? Well, on the 21st of June 1991, mm. when Mr. Narasimha Rao became Prime Minister mm. and Dr. Manmohan Singh was sworn in and was told that he was going to be the Finance Minister, mm. India had $900 million worth of foreign exchange reserves. Less you than know, today, dollars today we have $360 billion, mm. billion mm. but we had only $900 million, which was enough for five days of imports. Mm. Mm. No credit lines available to India, exports stagnant, Nobody giving us any money, 40 tons of gold mortgaged to the Bank of England and other borrowers to borrow money. We got about $250 million, $220 right. million dollars yes, yes. against that gold. So in other, in other words, we were completely bankrupt. The threat of default was not academic. The threat of default was actually very real. And no creditor was willing to give us lines of credit. Remember, we were borrowing to roll over the previous loans. You know, because you've been an insider, I must ask you at this stage, it wasn't as if default was an unknown concept. Other economies had defaulted. Why was it sacrosanct that India no, no, did no, not for, default? For India, default, That's what Why default, was, it, default has a very fine principle, it which does. I yes. talked about in the book, that yes. if you owe somebody $5,000, you should be worried. If you owe somebody $5 billion, he should be worried. That's right. right? Yes. This is what Latin Americans have done, Africans have done. Yes. But India had not borrowed extensively in the past. Mm. It was very prudent, but it was equally prudent in repaying. We were very conservative. We were, fisc we were very prudent when it came to borrowing. Mm. Whatever we borrowed, we repaid on time. What was true of households, we, you know, we are not a That's highly true. indebted economy <laughs> in right. terms of households, unlike American families. True. It's only now that we're getting into credit cards and so on and so forth. But historically, remember, we haven't been like we that. We haven't been like that. So. And that perhaps came in good stead. So default was something that was an anathema. Mm. Uh, this was an option that was uh, suggested to Mr. Manmo uh, to Dr. Ma uh, to Mr. Narasimha Rao. It was vetoed mm. by Dr. Manmohan Singh instantly. I think Mr. Narasimha Rao toyed with the idea of the default because there were many left economists, for example, yes. which I have discussed in the book, who were suggesting that there is nothing sacrosanct about not going for a default. But Dr. Manmohan Singh, from day one, kept repeating that we will not default, we will not default, we will not default. And I think that was a great confidence building measure. You know, your book talks about how uh, uh, reforms happen, and I'm going to come to that in just a bit. But as someone who was an insider then, and you've given many accounts of how you were privy to a lot of decisions that were being made, uh, India seems to reform in a crisis. And this reform of 1991 was actually done by a minority government. Yeah. I mean, no, it was an absolute majority. How difficult was it to sell it politically? Let's be very clear. Mm. This was reforms born out of compulsion. Mm. Okay. Mm. This we was, had no other way. We no had other no way. other option. We went to the IMF. 
the IMF didn't put pressure on us, but we knew what the IMF's prize was going to be. So mm. we were smart. There's a cartoon, you know, know at, it, at the back right cover the back. of my book, Narasimha Rao telling Manmohan Singh, don't, coming out of the IMF office and telling Manmohan Singh, R.K. Lakshman cartoon, don't tell them that the IMF twisted our arms, tell them that we twisted them ourselves. Right, I yeah. think that summarized mm. economic reforms beautifully by Mr. Lakshman. Mm. Now, the point is, there was a crisis. The crisis created a compulsion, mm. compulsion created reforms. But reforms were so successful within two years that the prisoners of compulsion became the champions of conviction. You know, Mr. Narsimha all started talking as if they always had reforms on their mind. Sure. That's, that's not true, I mean, to be very honest. Mm. You're right to say that the trigger was compulsion. We had no other choice, we had no other way out. But how tough was it to convince the political bosses, the political class, so to say? I think the key was political management. You had this unlikely Jugalbandi mm. of Mr. Narasimha Rao and Dr. Manmohan Singh. Mm. Dr. Manmohan Singh, I have described as the hedgehog. I am going to come you to know? that. And I will, yes. Mr. Rao was the wily old fox, manipulative. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'll talk about that equation. The politics and how it, of it. Yes. The politics of it. You know, he managed the opposition. Mm. He had to manage the left. He had to manage the BJP. And most importantly, he had to manage his own party. That's right. Because the bulk of the Congress party was not sold on economic reforms. In fact, in the first meeting of the Congress Parliamentary Party, out of about 300 odd MPs, only two MPs supported Dr. Manmohan Singh on his July 24, 91 budget. Mm. Mr. Mani Shankar uh, and Mr. Nathuram Mirda. Mm. So, <laughs> reforms were deeply unpopular across the political spectrum. They were an unknown commodity. Mm. People were thinking that we were abandoning uh, 50 years of a commitment to public sector, that we were abandoning a commitment to uh, poor, we were abandoning a commitment to balanced regional development and you know we were embracing market uh, market based economic policies. So Mr. Narasimha Rao had you know had to listen, he had to communicate, he had to build a political constituency and remember in 91 the BJP today which is the greatest champion of FDI the BJP the said, place. domestic liberalization, we'll support you, but we are against FDI. We are against external liberalization. The left, of course, was against both internal liberalization and, and external, external liberalization. Yes. But I must talk to you about devaluation. This is the first time that India woke up to devaluation. It must have been a tough call and we, we've heard anecdotes in the book talks about how actually devaluation by it was done thanks to no mobiles there because no, no, Rajan remember to on take the calls. 5th of June and it wasn't and like your book rightly points out it's not a matter of price it was a matter of pride. Devaluation proved to be hugely controversial politically mm. the 5th of Jan June 1966 yes. when Mrs. Gandhi devalued by 57 percent. Mm. Kamaraj who was the Congress president was opposed to it the entire Congress party was opposed to it and Mrs. Gandhi later on you know, felt that she had been bamboozled uh, into that devaluation. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Narsim Rao belonged to Mrs. Gandhi's generation. So and it was he, a matter of pride. he went into devaluation very reluctantly. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was not even a one-step devaluation like Mrs. Gandhi's devaluation. It was a two-step devaluation. Mm -hmm. It was one on the 1st of June, uh, 1st of uh, July, mm -hmm. and the second one was on the 3rd of July. So, you know, um, uh, he was... Uh, he had to be convinced. I think Dr. Rangarajan uh, from the RBI, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh, of course, uh, did convince him. He was not entirely convinced about the two-step devaluation. He, I had a discussion yes, with him, which I have recounted in the book. But finally, it went talk through. Talk about it. It went through. And I think he kept, he kept saying, uh, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh kept saying, we are adjusting. He never rupee. used the word he devaluation. He never used the word devaluation. Yes. And Dr. Neither did Dr. Rangarajan. Mm. They said, we are adjusting the rupee. We are responding to market forces. Mm. Uh, we are carrying out adjustments to the rupee. Uh, and he did get rate. cold feet after the first round itself. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, you see, after the first round, Dr. Um, um, uh, he got such a backlash yes. from the political, uh, you know, from his political allies, mm. from within the party. Uh, and he felt maybe he was going the Indira Gandhi way in 1966. Mm. So he tried actually to stop the second devaluation. Mm. But by then, Dr. Manmohan Singh and Mr. Dr. Rangarajan had in fact conspired in a very nice way. And, uh, and, and the so devaluation go. got done on 9.30 in the morning. Mm. Uh, and uh, I think the call from the Prime Minister uh, to Dr. Manmohan Singh to stop the devaluation came at about 9 o'clock. Uh, by the time Dr. Manmohan Singh called Dr. Rangarajan, the devaluation had already been announced. But I, think, no but I think Dr. Then. Manmohan Singh and Mr. Rangarajan knew what was going to happen. And yes, thank God for no mobiles. 
because then you know you Mr. Narasimha had, had put on the mobile and spoken to Dr. Rangarajan early in the morning itself. You mm. know, you know your book also talks about, and I am going to refer to the uh, the uh, the combination that you say the hedgehog versus the fox. Uh, Not versus and the and fox. the fox. And All right, and the fox. Uh, talk to about that combination. It was a very unlikely coming together of two individuals. Yeah. Uh, when you were an insider and when you were an officer on special duty, did you really think that these two people will rise to the occasion and usher in the greatest no, see, economic it's, reforms it's, it's our remarkable. country would see? It's a, it's a most unlikely jugal bandi. Mm. They were pillars of the ancient regime. They were p pillars of the ancien regime. They were pillars of the establishment. They were known as socialist, uh, you know. And uh, took pride uh, in that. And Mr. Narsim Rao had a completely lackluster and nondescript ministerial career. Mm. Dr. Manmohan Singh had a very distinguished career as an economic administrator in finance ministry, planning commission, RBI, but he had not been known for, you know, yes. market re reforms. He was known as, uh, you know, a pragmatic uh, individual. Uh, he had been known as somebody who uh, was, had unimpeachable integrity, mm. uh, but he was not, he was not a Montek Singh Aluwalia sure. for that, for yes. that matter, yes. you know. Who would you give credit for in hindsight? A, a finance minister who understood the compulsions and went ahead and pushed economic liberalization? A prime minister who willingly and not so willingly at times decided to play ball? Where does the credit really Well, I am I'm very clear in my mind. Hmm. Without Dr. Manmohan Singh, Mr. Rao couldn't have accomplished what he did. Hmm. And without Mr. Rao, Dr. Manmohan Singh couldn't have accomplished what he did. The political management hmm. was as essential as the technocratic design. Uh, the technocratic design is what Dr. Manmohan Singh uh, was responsible for. The political management was what uh, Mr. Narsim Rao was responsible for. And I give full marks to both of them. Mm. But I also give, uh, uh, you know, one should also not forget that very often in public life, it's not what you say uh, that is critical, but who is saying it. Mm. And the fact is that these were two quote unquote socialist fuddy duddies that's right you know calling for a complete market change liberalization. market liberalization and in fact there's an interview which i have you know uh, mentioned in the book which k n raj mm. gave to frontline now k n raj is considered to be a left centered economist sure. the doyen of indian economists mm. and k n raj said well the situation is serious uh, many things have to be done but i have total confidence in manmohan singh if he says something has to be done and he does it i will back him and for a leftist and like him to back manmohan and, and, and Mr. Narsim Rao felt mm. that that one interview of Mr. K. N. Raj was the seal of approval as far as he was concerned. You know, I must though uh, touch upon something that your book briefly mentions and you've spoken about it in the past as well, that uh, Narsim Rao, when he rose in parliament to blunt the opposition that was coming his way and, and you know, you sum it up very nicely as well, the whole Sanskrit Upanishad that was used, it wasn't financial jargon that was thrown at the opposition. He chose to go at the no, complete no, no, no. opposite no, end of the spectrum. He bowled googly after googly. And what he, was he floored, he floored the opposition. He floored Mr. Vajpayee. Mm. He floored Dr. Manmohan, uh, Dr. Murli Manohar Joshi, who prided themselves, you know, on their Upanishadic wisdom. And he kept saying, uh, you know, uh, Vinashak, you know, when he when he said Sarvanashe samutpanne ardham tejati panditaha, that is at a time of destruction, the wise abandons one half so that he can protect the one half. So he said, I have not uh, uh, compromised Indian sovereignty. All I have done. Is Sarvanashe Samutpanne Ardham Tejati Panditaha. And then somebody accused him of selling off to the IMF. Mm. He said, I have not sold off anything to the IMF. This is uh, reforms is a Mahaprasthana. Mahaprasthana is word from the Mahabharata. Mahabharata yes. uh, you know, where Yudhishthira followed by his brothers and the dog is on the way to heaven. And that's called the Mahaprasthana Parva. I think it's book 16 sure. or book 17 of the right. Mahabharata. And, you know, people were shell shocked. You know, how are them did yeah, you understand? Yeah, you are saying economic reforms and, and know, financial liberalization. The idiom, the yes. idiom that he was using, the language that he was using, no fancy jargon, no big bang reforms, no words like shock therapy, that's right. uh, first generation, second No financial second jargon. Gen Absolutely not. Homespun. Because you were an insider and because you were a part of the establishment that was bringing about these changes, on hindsight, you know, we can judge a lot of history. But at that point in time, did you think 
this was path breaking this was going to change the course of our history well on the industrial policy side certainly i thought it mm. was because what we were doing mm. is we were just taking mrtp we were taking ferra uh, we were taking the whole licensing system uh, and we were not doing marginal changes here and there like we did in the 80s right i had been part of that marginal change regime in the mid 80s as mm. well mm. when i was in the industry ministry but here we were doing a complete bonfire mm. you know we were just lighting a fire under them and under the controls and saying you know this kind goodbye uh, so yes i mean i but um, uh, as as i told you um, there was a lot of ambivalence because indian industry was opposed to trade liberalization right, yes. indian industry was opposed to fdi mm. bjp was opposed to fdi bjp was a uh, opposed to trade liberalization left parties were opposed to whatever was being done mm. and within the congress party there, there was deep concern. concern deep ambivalence you know that public sector was being abandoned mm. that you know too much was being made of the private sector and so on so the overall political mahol was not one of you know gung ho uh, that we need to do the reforms but you know there was something that you know there is a compulsion there is a crisis and narsimha rao and manmohan singh can be trusted to do the right, right thing, thing. Yeah. and that's the yeah. main feeling it's about keeping the faith do you have faith you know i must to ask you at this point in time that while your party was ambivalent about it and all of those things you still went ahead i mean you you know the congress party still went ahead and which is why you call the original authors of economic reforms in india what happened in the years that followed because you went from market liberalization no, to free market economy to a lot of political entanglement no, we began to lose elections of one by one mm. mr narsimha rao lost the karnataka and andhra elections mm. you know mm. uh, in uh, 94 very badly very very badly he lost his own home state of andhra right, yes. you know and then he lost the 96 elections mm. Uh, so yeah, I mean, electorally things didn't work out the way it should have, uh, and many people ascribed uh, our poor electoral performance uh, to, to the, the fact economic that reforms. you know we were not able uh, to do the reforms in a manner in which people saw the benefit. Mm. Then we had Babri Masjid that took place, you know, on the sixth of December, the demolition, sixth mm. of December, ninety two, uh, which created further problems for India, uh, for the Congress Party vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Muslims, in particularly in North India. Mm. So I think it was a combination of factors. But on hindsight, do you believe uh, good yeah, economics can wrong. never be good politics? I do, I think you're wrong to say that the Congress Party disowned the reforms because after all, not disowned, uh, but you became a little apologetic about it. We didn't. It. After all, Mrs. Gandhi, Sonia Gandhi, after she became the Congress President, mm -hmm. she set up an economic introspection group. We came up with a with a report which gave the seal of a political seal of approval, so to speak. Uh, for the reforms that were to follow, and uh, you know these reforms then were taken up by the UPA government. But you did go from free market economy to a lot of entitlement economy. We never used the word free market economy. I was clear in my mind oh. we were not moving to a free market economy. I mean, I have never in my Use writings, in my speeches, never in, in some of the speeches that I drafted for Mr. Narasimha Rao also, and some which he, which he gave on the 9th of July on television, never was the word free, free market. market economy used. Never was the word market forces also used. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important how you communicate what you're doing. And do you believe good economics never really makes for good politics? No, it's not true. I mean, you know, uh, for example, uh, if you have high inflation, mm -hmm. you lose elections. Low inflation does not win you elections, That's but true. high inflation certainly costs you elections. Mm -hmm. As the BJP discovered in '98 in Delhi, Rajasthan, sure. and Madhya Pradesh, and it that too it was the price of onions that cost them the election. So yes, I mean I think you know you do good economics. You 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 do economic if you do good economics and people begin to see the benefits, mm. uh, people begin to see an improvement in their quality of life. Mm. Uh, but that does not automatically translate. into uh, in a positive electoral performance because ultimately my view mm. having been in politics for the last 25 years elections are not about achievements elections are about sentiments you know you can have all the fantastic achievements but if the sentiment is against you i mean this is what happened to us in 2014 we had phenomenal achievements from 2009 to 2014 and the sentiment, the sentiment the sentiment Uh, was against us, and whether it, the sentiment was built up against us, thanks to you know Anna Hazare, Arvind Kejriwal, Swami Ramdev, you know the Narendra Modi, but there was a sentiment against us. Now, could you have, in hindsight, controlled that sentiment building against you? 
we have to it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a long struggle it's a tough it's a tough battle for us are you it's on not something that's going to happen overnight are you on course <coughs> to changing that sentiment i think so i think uh, we have to change that sentiment uh, and what is helping us is that mr modi made a lot of tall promises mm. uh, when he wanted to change that sentiment uh, and uh, he is not I mean, for many of those promises, what I would use, I would say they turned out to be Kokla. I you mean, know, when we, when we talk about this hollow. book, it is very important that we talk about it in the present context as well. And which is why I must ask you a question. 25 years of economic liberalization, a prime minister is now sworn in office, the first majority government in economically liberalized India. Have they put their political capital to use? Do not wear the opposition's hat, but wear the hat of the man who's written this book, who's prime seen minister. economic... The reforms. prime minister has not been a Narsama Rao. Mr. Jaitley has not been a Dr. Manmohan Singh. Of course, there is no crisis. Okay, it's, we are, it's, True, we are yes. running a successful economy. Mm -hmm. For the last 20 years, we've been running an economy that has grown. That's hardly stable. You know, it's with. running at over 6.5% per mm -hmm. year. So we've had you know, ups and downs, one year, one, two years. But you know, today when the economy grows at 6%, we shout recession. Right. We shout you know, slowdown. So we've had 6.5% rate of growth over the last 25 years, yeah. which is a great achievement. And uh, Narsim Rao started it, Deve Gowda, Gujral, Vajpayee, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh built on it. Yeah. Now, uh, my regret is that um, the political outreach yeah. and the political engagement uh, that Mr. Narsim Rao indulged in yeah. uh, and Dr. Manmohan Singh engaged in uh, when he was finance minister uh, is not to be seen by Mr. Modi. Uh, and Mr. Jaitley. So because you spoke about uh, the consensus building that Narsimha Rao seemingly tried to do is not happening right now, I must make it a little more relevant to what we are going to experience. India for GST and the government has said they will reach out to you, uh, but they've you're not willing to... That, they've been saying that for two years. What is it that you want the government to do? You raise no, three I demands, mean, they're willing to settle for one. Uh, they don't want to put that in the constitution, the, the no, cap on the GST bill. See, you can't have communication via Facebook and Twitter and ET now. You've got to have face-to-face -face communication. You've got to have a dialogue. You've got to have give and take. You've got to have compromise. You have to give the other guys the credit. This is what Narsim Rao was doing all the time. If you want a lesson from 25 years... They say years, you are the original know, authors of the GST passed. If you want a lesson from 1991, that's the lesson. You know, and uh, that's a very powerful lesson. Political management, learn from Narsim Rao. Is, is and opposition Dr. to the Singh. GST political? No, no. First of all, Mr. Narendra Modi is the last one to preach to us the virtues of GST. Mm. The UPA government introduced the GST bill in the Lok Sabha in March 2011. And for three years, Mr. Modi, supported by Mr. Yashwan Sinha, who was a particularly obstructionist chairman of the standing committee, mm successfully they had a joint venture they sabotaged and subverted the gst bill but for, now for three years and mr modi now becomes the greatest champion saying that india will not be able to abolish poverty unless it introduces gst nothing is more uh, amusing to me than this, this statement of mr modi Ms. the gujarat government led by mr modi single-handedly opposed the introduction of gst even today there are large sections within the G B bjp who are opposed to the gst in fact they're using the congress as a shield mm. they're using the congress as an excuse not to bring in gst they are completely reluctant but as, to bring but in as GST. original authors of the gst does it does it disturb you that that bill has been stuck in limbo why don't you throw your wait behind it first of all let's not overdo you know this is not something that is a panacea for all aisles gst needs to be done mm. it needs to reduce the transaction costs but you can't have a gst rate at 25 percent or 26 percent and that's why we have recommended the cap of 18 percent but you if can't put a have, cap of the rate in the constitution why not it's it's yeah, not give me a practical. reason give me a reason i have we've had this debate in parliament yes there are there are uh, you know monetary number there are specific quantitative numbers mentioned in the constitution but if you don't want it in the constitution you can have it in the gst bill yeah which is right now under which will be under discussion will you, will, will after you, the constitutional amendment you will come forward with the gst bill mm. but these are options you can discuss these options who is who has sat down on a table and discussed it now one percent they go they arbitrarily they, they are okay with one percent going when, that's a consensus know? they say that one percent can go and states want it to go i think the two well, things states don't want it to go gujarat, so doesn't, states, yes. gujarat doesn't want it to go maharashtra doesn't want it to go tamil nadu of course is opposed to the yes. gst in, in particular in, in, you know, no, in no, 
Yeah, totally. my question to you is that the opposition has boiled down to two issues. One is, should you put the rate or the cap within the no, first of all, I itself? don't. I don't believe in communicating with the government through TV channels. Mm. Okay, political communication has to take place between political personalities. Political communication means. You identify your positions, you discuss your positions, you work out a compromise in a spirit of give and take. That's not happening. There was a tea party well. that happened between Mrs. Gandhi and Mohan Singh, yeah, Prime Minister, Finance Minister. Isn't that for building political yeah, but consensus? But then what happened after that? The Congress party gave its objections in oh, writing, oh. handed over a note to the Prime Minister. Did the Prime Minister send back a letter to Mrs. Gandhi or to Dr. Manmohan Singh, saying that these are the reasons why we don't agree or these are the reasons why we agree or we partially agree we don't have any piece of paper from the government we had a six page paper from the government on that uh, why they were doing the amendments to the land acquisition act which we responded you know uh, so i mean these are political matters they have to be dealt with politically and i i have and there was a select committee that was set up the select committee made some recommendations fine so why is the government fighting shy of having a face-to-face -face discussion. If they reach out to you, will you be far more amiable to passing the GST? The job of reaching out is that of the government. The opposition's job is not to reach out. Okay? Mm. The opposition's job, as defined it's by Mr. Pranav Mukherjee uh, many years ago to me, he says, Jairam, the job of the opposition is to oppose, expose and depose. That's right. Okay? Yes. It's the job of the government mm. to create a consensus. And I know, we all know that unanimity is not possible. But consensus is possible. A broad agreement is possible that this is the way forward. Do you believe By the way, in 91, yes. there was no unanimity. Absolutely. On but FDI, you there was no unanimity. Alignment but there consensus. was a broad consensus. The BJP that this has to be fell done. in line. The left parties fell in line. Can the Congress fall in line on this? If they try it on the GST, if they try to build a consensus. No, let them try. Let the government try. Let them honestly try. As, somebody, as somebody who has, and I'm going to wrap this up by going back to your book, as somebody who has played his part in the economic reforms of 1991, uh, not just by being there, but also by authoring the book and recounting how it all happened, uh, can you assure our viewers, and you know, they are stakeholders in the Indian economy, that the Congress is for the GST? 100%. Mr. Rahul Gandhi has said this repeatedly, mm. Dr. Manmohan Singh has said this repeatedly, Mr. Chidambaram has said this repeatedly, Mrs. Gandhi has said this, I have said, I mean all of us have said this. The Congress party wants a pro-industry GST, the Congress party wants a pro-trade GST, but most importantly the Congress party wants a pro-consumer GST. Mm. We don't want GST to benefit only the fat cats of Indian industry. We want GST to benefit trade. We want GST to benefit consumers, ordinary consumers. We want Jhumri Talaya to benefit from GST, not just South Bombay. Fair point indeed. And after playing that part in economic reforms, we do hope that you will play the part uh, as India wants and India for GST. Thank, Thank you very much for speaking to us. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash etnow and don't forget to click the like button. You can also follow us on Twitter at etnowlive. To stay updated with all our programming, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel by logging on to youtube.com slash user slash etnow.